Good afternoon, I'm Victor Vakale from the University of Minnesota. This is a repetitive presentation from a different country. That's the only difference. I want to thank the Society for giving me the opportunity to present our work, and I have no disclosures. So peptic ulcer has a lifetime prevalence of 5%, and 10 to 20% of these ulcers eventually develop a complication. Hemorrhage is eight times more common than a perforation, but the mortality associated with uh, a perforation is five times that of a bleeding peptic ulcer. And that varies uh, depending on socioeconomics, uh, uh, status of the country, and the source of data from uh, three to 20 percent. So oh, a number of surgical techniques have been employed to repair the ulcer, including a primary, simple primary closure, uh, primary closure with an omento overlay, occluding the perforation with a uh, vascularized pedicle of the omentum, which is uh, the Sullins jones repair or the modified Grams patch. This is probably the most common uh, type of repair used. And the original Grams patch, was, which was a free uh, omental patch repair. So current evidence, this repair can be performed either using a laparoscopic or an open approach, and there remains considerable debate on the right technique, few RCTs, uh, five RCTs, and a few meta-analyses have uh, compared these outcomes with mixed results. The largest series had uh, uh, five randomized trials with a pooled sample size of 400 patients, 200 in each arms, and they had equal vocal results. Interestingly, a, um, a national in inpatient sample review noted that less than 3% of these operations are performed laparoscopically in the United States. So in our study, we evaluated and compared these two techniques uh, by performing a 12-year retrospective review of the American College of Surgeons National uh, NISQIP database. We identified all adult patients with, uh, who underwent a peptic ulcer repair uh, using ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes. Subsequently, we excluded patients who had gastrojejunal ulcers, secondary to bariatric surgery, uh, who had atypical comorbidities, that those are listed, and any additional surgical intervention within the same operative period. Using CPT codes, we stratify these patients into open or laparoscopic, laparoscopic surgery. We had a total sample size of 6,400 patients, 5,600 5, in the open group, and 600 patients in the laparoscopic group. Subsequently, to mitigate selection bias, we used univariate analyses and identified all variables that were different between these two populations. And we used propensity score matching uh, to perform a one to three matched controlled, uh, case to control ratio matched analyses. Uh, propensity score matching is a um, pseudo randomization technique used in retrospective uh, reviews. In the matched, after matching, we had a total sample size of 2,400 patients. And we matched these patients on demographics, clinical comorbidities, and uh, severity scores. After matching, we had 1,800 patients in the open group, and we matched 100% of patients in the laparoscopic group. Subsequently, to ensure appropriate matching, we assessed balance um, in the matched population. Uh, we also, to mi mitigate any residual selection bias, we used general estimating equations, and we controlled for um, Conf clinical confounders including age, demographics, sex, location of the ulcer, clinical comorbidity scores, and severity scores. Our outcomes of interest included perioperative outcomes and 30-day postoperative mort mortality and morbidity outcomes. This next slide is a little busy. However, it dem demonstrates our univariate uh, analysis um, in the baseline population consisting of 6,000 200 patients, we compared over 60 clinical variables, and all the text highlighted in the red represents variable that were statistically different between the two populations, suggesting that there was some selection bias for the patients who underwent open surgery. To mitigate this, I contrast that table with the table that demonstrates balance after matching. As you may see, um, or notice the absence of any red, suggesting that we successfully matched uh, all patients in the laparoscopic group to appropriate controls in the open group. This included matching on wound classifications, preoperative labs, and ASA scores. And then we created two homogeneous populations to ensure that our final treatment effects were comparable. In terms of treatment, after matching, our operative time was significantly lower in the open surgery group with limited operative space 
restricted intra-abdominal mo mo mobility. Performing a copious intra-abdominal irrigation and meticulous surgical closure can be hard with the laparoscopic ap approach, and this possibly may explain our findings. However, despite lower operative times, the laparoscopic uh, increased operative time, sorry, the laparoscopic group was associated with a shorter duration of hospital stay. In terms of uh, postoperative infectious complications, operative surgery was associated with twice the odds of developing a superficial surgical site infection. And although deep incisional uh, infection rates were much higher in the open group, we did not have enough uh, events in the laparoscopic group to evaluate this statistically. Other infectious complication rates were similar that include pneumonias, UTIs, and sepsis. In terms of non-infectious complications, open surgery was as associated with an increased odds of prolonged hospital ventila uh, prolonged ventilation and wound dehiscence. A larger incision coupled with a higher rate of, of wound infection may explain these findings. Other non-infectious complication rates that included pulmonary embolism, pneumonias, ac acute renal failures, and myocardial infarction rates were similar between both groups. In our study, reoperation rates, 30-day reoperation rates, were similar between both these groups. Leakage from the ulcer repair site is often deemed a major cause for uh, reoperations, and hence this outcome variable could potentially be used as a surrogate marker for the same. A number of previous studies have expressed concern for the laparoscopic approach to have had uh, higher rates of uh, suture site leakage. However, in our study, we did not find this association. Importantly, after we propensity score matched and additionally used general estimating, estimating equations to control for a number of clinical confounders, uh, the open surgery was independently associated with increased mortality. We feel that mortality in this population is uh, inextricably linked to inflammation and sepsis, and that a minimally invasive approach uh, may be beneficial. Uh, we acknowledge our limitations, um, which are inherent to the ACS NISQIP. Um, coding errors are one among them. We did not evaluate conversion rates from laparoscopic to open surgery. Oops, sorry. Unmeasured covariates include the size of the perforation, surgical technique, surgeon experience, and time from presentation to surgery. We did not evaluate other outcomes of interest, including pain, return of bowel function, and long-term complications such as hernias. Despite this, this is the largest retrospective cohort study from the United States to our knowledge. The infrequency and the acuity of diagnosis often precludes the design of a well-randomized controlled trial in this population of patients. And most RCTs conducted to date have significant heterogeneity between the two populations. We matched 100% of our patients in the laparoscopic group to appropriate controls, and we used a robust statistical approach to measure our final treatment effects. So in conclusion, in our 12-year review, laparoscopic surgery was associated with decreased postoperative morbidity and mortality. In the United States, less than 10% of the ulcer repairs were performed laparoscopically. Given our results, a minimally invasive technique may be beneficial. It may be cost-effective. It may help improve pain control, augment gastrointestinal motility and function, promote pulmonary toilet, and enhance overall postoperative recovery. Future, di future directions include uh, developing low and high fidelity surgical simulators uh, to help improve surgical scale. The figure on to the right is a low, low fidelity surgical simulator that we use at our institution. And this next picture is, is we actually training our residents to perform this laparoscopically. Thank you very much for your attention and happy to take any questions.